Chapter 13, High Renaissance Art, Part 1, Italy. Here's the map of Europe. Um, it should look quite different than any map that we've looked at thus far. And um, you can see the the colors are not specific to countries or to political affiliations, but they reflect the religious changes in Europe. So um, yellow indicates Roman Catholic, Lutheran, Protestant is that sort of peach color, which is mostly up in Scandinavia and a lot of Germany there. And Orthodox, very small minority, Anglican, mostly in England, I'd say, yeah, uh, exclusively in England, and then Calvinist. So the Lutherans, the Anglicans, and the Calvinists are all Protestants. They have all, they are all forming, um, following the event in 1517, which we will talk about in this lecture. And there's an inset there showing Italy. But in other words, this is a time of religious upheaval. This cohesion that had linked Europe by a common faith, which was Roman Catholicism, is going to be shattered. And you can just look at France and you see all these little spots of Calvinism. Uh, there was a lot of conflict because of these people who disagreed. And uh, anyway, we'll get into that later, but I just want you to see what's coming so you can be prepared. So the High Renaissance. A Renaissance humanism shifted its focus to critical exploration of new ideas, the natural world, and distant lands. The important reformer Martin Luther and the Counter-Reformation Council of Trent shaped Protestant and Catholic establishments. Travel became easier, which led to greater cultural exchange. A couple of vocabulary words down there, uh, chiaroscuro, which means modeling light to dark. It's an Italian word, which literally means light dark. And sfumato, which is smoke-like modeling. So uh, you will see both of those. You may have heard these in the past because um, today's lecture will begin by looking at the three giants, or it shows four, but there are really three um, in central Italy, three, qual three giants of Renaissance art. So the qualities of the high Renaissance include a self-confident humanism, an admiration for classical forms, and a sense of stability and order. Artists that dominate the period are Leonardo, Raphael, Michelangelo, and Titian. And their uh, self-portraits are over, or their portraits are on the right. Um, so you've probably heard of all of them, maybe not Titian. Anyway, we're going to begin with the oldest of all of them, which is Leonardo da Vinci. So Leonardo trained under Andrea del Verrocchio in Florence. His passion was not restricted to painting, but expanded to mathematics, science, botany, meteorology, and engineering. <clears throat> He's widely regarded as the quintessential Renaissance man, a person with wide-ranging interests and abilities. His fame spread throughout Europe because of communication, because of printing and paper. Um, the King of France managed to lure him to his court where Leonardo spent his final days. Bucking the trend of reviving classical ideals, Leonardo relied on intellect and investigation. He was very innovative and forward-looking. He was a true progressive. His interests included botany, geology, geography, cartography, zoology, military engineering, animal lore, anatomy, and aspects of physical science, including hydraulics and mechanics. See, I added to the list on the screen. His art was primarily informed by his studies in optics, perspective, light, and color. So never forget, I hope you remember from um, early Renaissance art, that Florence was the center of the art world in the early Renaissance. So it's, it's no um, mistake that 
from Florence come many of the great artists of the high renaissance. So Leonardo kept notebooks. This is what he's really known for, um, writing down his ideas, doing little sketches of the things he's thinking about. So he was an avid journaler. Um, this is a self-portrait he did, and it shows him as an older man. But just you can see the sensitivity, the observation of his eyes, uh, all the lines around him. So it's amazing, this, this drawing ability. On the right are two of his other sketches from his notebooks that show some of his inventions, his designs, his ideas. I have no idea what they are, but um, there's plenty of information online about Leonardo's notebooks. Here's another sketch from one of his notebooks. It is the fetus and liming of the uterus. And this is early 16th century. So the it is believed that he had been present at several um, anatomical research or uh, I would say uh, dissection of cadavers that was performed in Florence. So he saw the inner workings of the human body and was very interested in these and so sketched them. Um, so this one and then this one, of course. So it's completely different. This is called the Vitruvian Man. It's highly iconic. I dare say you've seen it before somewhere. Uh, Vitruvius was the first century BCE architect and engineer. He inspired Leonardo to seek ideal proportions of man. Uh, they didn't know each other. I hope you see first century BCE is a long time before Leonardo was born. And just an aside, Vitruvius was the same man who wrote the description of the Etruscan temple that the model was built from that we saw when we were looking at Etruscan art. So this Vitruvius had a deep root and deep effect, a profound effect in later periods. So uh, Leonardo determined that ideal body height should be the heights in the eight heads high, or maybe Vitruvius determined that. Uh, Leonardo added his own observations to this well-known diagram of the ideal male figure, the Vitruvian man. So you can see uh, the, the man, the ideal proportions are inscribed within a square, which is also situated within a circle. So it's all kind of looking at what is and coming up with some some geometric principles and saying this equals that and this is perfection. So interested in this. And this, to me, uh, echoes what, what Brunelleschi was about in the earlier Renaissance. So uh, here is a collection of all the paintings that are attributed to Leonardo da Vinci, all of them for his entire life. And I showed you his self-portrait, so you know he had a very long life. And he is considered a very great artist, but he did not create a lot of paintings. It is, um, several years ago, there was a novel called The Da Vinci Code that was a fictionalized sort of fantasy about Leonardo. And one of the statements in the novel was that he was very prolific and he had a huge number of paintings. And um, I'm sorry to say that was completely false, that he did not have a lot of paintings. So I, um, I amassed all of them and put them together here to show you. Um, the ones down in the lower right corner, in fact, are unfinished paintings. So he, he would get, he was kind of like ADD, where he would be extremely interested. He could have a hyper focus and work really hard on a composition. And you can see here, too, that are very, very similar, where he sort of reworked an idea and then uh, would let it go, uh, move away. So if, if he got too bored with these compositions, he would just move on and go to something else, probably to his notebooks and work on it. So um, another painting surfaced a few years ago that 
many people, but not everyone, believed was a Leonardo painting. She was called the Polish Princess because the painting turned up in Poland. Um, but I don't know. I put a question mark over her. I include her just for your enjoyment. Um, so this is one of his most famous and most iconic paintings, and it is The Last Supper. It was painted in a monastery in Milan, so it's not even in Florence. But his fame was so great that the Duke of Milan uh, lured him there to paint this in a monastery. It is on the refectory wall. This will be a quiz question. A refectory is the dining room. So it was in this room, and I wanted you to see the entire room and see the size of the painting. This is where the dining tables, where the monks would eat their dinners and breakfasts, and whatever meal they would have. The tables were lined up, so every monk could look up to his left or his right and see the Lord, their Lord, um, at the head table of the dining room, so dining with his disciples. And here's a, a zoom in of this. So Leonardo arranged the disciples in four groups of three as they flank the stable pyramidal form of Jesus in the middle. So um, Leonardo's principles about painting are that the composition should be perfect and should be stable, and to be stable it needs to be balanced, and often this stability comes from a pyramidal form where um, it's like a, um, a, a triangle that is wider at the bottom. So it rests on the floor. So Jesus' body, for example, is a very nice, almost equilateral triangle. So Leonardo uh, put that out there as perfection. Leonardo also uses linear perspective, but it doesn't dominate the composition. So he uses it on the sides and on this coffered ceiling. There's a lot of devices he used here. He didn't give Jesus a traditional halo, but instead surrounded his head with this light from the window. Uh, and none of the other disciples, of course, have halos. Nobody actually has a halo. The scene is set in a stage-like recession with the orthogonals of the one-point linear perspective converging at the head of Jesus. So the figures are modeled in chiaroscuro, which is the light-to-dark modeling, and this is fresco. And sadly, um, Leonardo, well, I mean, he, he was aware of the, the issues with fresco, and that is that the pigments that are that are soaked into the plaster tend to look a little chalky a little because you've got the white plaster and it's not shiny it doesn't have this deep uh, saturation that you have in the oil paints so he was trying to overcome that drawback by adjusting the formulas for his fresco and it was not successful. His experiments were very bad. Like before he was finished painting, the paints that he put on the wall were peeling off. So he had to repaint a lot. And this, this wall has been heavily restored. So I, you know, I don't like to say it, but it's quite possible that um, none of this paint was actually applied by Leonardo. I don't know. But it is Leonardo's imagination of what the dinner looked like, and it is by no means considered an authentic uh, representation of that event. Everybody seated on, seated on the same side of the table. Um, and, by the way, another counter-argument against the Da Vinci Code is this is supposedly reflects the moment when Jesus said, I tell you, one of you will betray me. It is not about him talking about the wine and the bread being his blood and his body. It is about um, him knowing that one of, one of the disciples was a bad person. So um, when we see Last Suppers, and I'm going to show you several of them, the artist almost always uses some device to show us 
who the betrayer is. And if you don't know the story, like Jesus had 12 disciples or students, people that followed him around faithfully. And one of them betrayed him to um, the authorities and that led to his arrest and his crucifixion. So um, the, this person becomes universally hated throughout history. And, and so the artist will make it very clear which one that bad person is. So now that I've said that and I've described the event and you've looked at all 12 of these men, in, in class I like to ask students to pick out the one that they think is the bad person and often they'll get it. But um, since we don't have that opportunity, I'll show you who it is. It's this man right here, and his face is in the shadow. And so that's the device that Leonardo used to single him out, to show him in darkness. Um, there are other devices that artists use, and I believe Judas here is clinging to a bag of coins. That signifies the price that, or the payment he was given for betraying Jesus. So that's another one of his signifiers. Now here, I'll bet you've never seen this before. Uh, the Mona Lisa is perhaps his most famous work, painted about 1503 to 1506. And she's quite possibly the most famous painting in the world. I also like to have a discussion with students about why she's so famous. And um, so far, it, it kind of relies on just this, you know, this momentum from our culture. She's famous because everybody says she's famous, and that's that's what it comes down to. Anyway, here's um, Mona. Uh, the distant hazy mountains give the subject uh, Lisa Gerardini del Giocondo a mysterious quality. Her direct stare and smile add to the effect. A thin tinted varnish created the sfumato smoky atmosphere. So there's that other word. Sumato. Now I'm gonna just. Oh, sorry. I thought I had a. I thought I had a single of her um, that we could focus on, but I. I, I recently edited this. Um, anyway, the sfumato modeling of Mona Lisa is this very, very subtle shading that you see around her facial features and around her neck. That's not really a dramatic modeling but it's very, very subtle, and Leonardo rather specialized in that. And I also like to point out that her smile, it owes quite a bit to that modeling, because if you look in the upper corners of her mouth, there's just a little hint of a shadow just applied up there that gives her that uh, quote-unquote mysterious smile. Uh, now, do you think she's lovely? Do you think she's the most beautiful woman you've ever seen? Do you find her enigmatic? I don't know. You're, you're free to do that if you wish. So this painting turned up, I'm going to say it was a couple of years ago. I believe it was in the fall of 2017 that this painting surfaced and became headline news because... Um, it had been owned by a private collector. It had been auctioned in the 1950s for a small amount. It was never attributed to Leonardo um, until it came up. It was, it was uh, going to be auctioned in that fall, 2017. And so it was restored. It was cleaned up. And these connoisseurs, connoisseurs are the art historians who determine whether a painting was or was not made by a, a well-known artist. So the connoisseurs studied it and came to a more or less agreement that it was painted by Leonardo da Vinci, which suddenly brought it into the headlines of newspapers and television. So this painting, after it was clean, and it's called Salvatore Mundi, which um, it depicts Jesus, and he's staring directly at the viewer. It's in a nice pyramidal form that Leonardo is known for. It, it has sfumato modeling on the face. He's holding a glass orb in his hand, um, which could represent the world. So this went on the auction block. I believe it was in November or December of that year. 
And um, I like my students to make a guess about the price that it got because this is really astounding. So it went for auction. And this is how much it sold for. That's right. It's not too many zeros. That is $450 million, 300000 That was the selling price for this painting. For one little painting. <clears throat> it was sold to a Saudi prince. As far as I know, it has not been put on display. The Louvre mounted a huge Leonardo exhibit. <clears throat> I'm going to say 2019. And this painting was supposed to be lent to the museum for that exhibit. And as far as I know, it never made it. But then something else has grabbed the headlines recently. So let's move on to our next artist. So I hope you've learned a little something about Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, I should also say most people just refer to him as Leonardo and never da Vinci. That just indicates a town where he was born. So, Rafael Sanzio. Rafael is from Urbino and was an itinerant painter. That means he traveled around uh, like a house painter. He will go where the work is in and around Florence. He showed great talent, which further developed when he was uh, exposed to the Florentine work of Leonardo da Vinci. Most of his subjects are religious, particularly virgin and child paintings, but he also painted many portraits. He died in Rome at the young age of 37. So it's really sad. He, ha he was very prolific for his short life, painted many more paintings than Leonardo did with his very long life. So the two, in contrast, couldn't be more different. So this is the type of composition that Raphael became famous for. He earned fame through his paintings of the Virgin and Child, such as the Madonna of the Goldfinch. The figures have carefully modeled drapery in the style of Leonardo, but the work's color is vibrant and light. So I described Leonardo's principle of the pyramidal design, and you can see this composition here. Um, it has a very narrow, narrow um, focus up at the top, and it widens down towards the bottom, so this makes it feel very stable. So this stability, this pyramidal composition, um, I'm not going to point out every single time you see it, but it's very prominent in high Renaissance art. So Madonna of the Goldfinch. And there's her face and where you can see the sfumato modeling around her eyes. But she's much brighter and uh, one would argue a little bit more attractive than Mona Lisa. And this, uh, the fame of this is coupled with the deep love that the Italian people held for the Virgin and Child, for the Madonna. So that continues since the Gothic period, um, and that's why he did so many paintings of the Madonna. <clears throat> now here's two paintings side by side so you can compare them. I told you that he emulated Leonardo, and he totally did. So... <clears throat> Mona Lisa on the left and this other portrait by Raphael on the right. And you can see many similarities, the pose, the sfumato modeling, the background. And think back, I showed you a couple of portraits from early Renaissance Italian art of these a man and a woman in profile. And I said, that's kind of the standard. And when these it's called a three-quarter view when a, a figure is not staring directly straight ahead but kind of turned like this. This is called a three-quarter view. Um, this is popularized by Leonardo and now Raphael in the High Renaissance. <clears throat> so Pope Julius... The second began a campaign to rebuild the Vatican, and this was to raise its profile, to make it seem important. He, he felt the rumblings of discontent in Europe, and he wanted to secure the role of the Roman Catholic Church in European history. So he wanted to remodel it and turn it into this grand uh, center of the one true faith. 
so the rebuilding included um, some extra buildings. There's a remodel coming of St. Peter's itself, but there's a lot going on around it. So um, he hired Raphael to come down from Florence and do some paintings there because Raphael also became famous in Florence. So his paintings included the School of Athens, uh, painted in the Stanza della Segnatura, which is this room. Harmoniously arranged forms and rational space complement the room in which it was painted. The philosophical figures, while idealized, have dynamically foreshortened contrapposto poses. So this is the room. I just wanted you to see the setting. We're going to look at this painting over here. But Raphael painted this as well. And the whole room is just very grand and coordinated. And this is a human-sized door. So um, that's where people come and go. Here's the painting that Raphael did that we're looking at, the School of Athens. It's a fresco painted on the wall there. Um, he's got pretty good color saturation for, for fresco. Notice his use of linear perspective, where he's created this imaginary building with barrel vaults, with coffered ceilings, um, niches with sculptures. And the figures here, uh, I have to point out, are have nothing to do with Christianity or Roman Catholicism. It's from a pagan world, and it shows how that classical world has great appreciation even in the highest ranks of the church. So this appearing in the, the Vatican is, I, I think, is, is noteworthy. So all of these figures represent... Um, the men of classical Greece, the great thinkers, the, the sort of what the Renaissance people are considering the high point of human history when great minds were thinking great thoughts and doing great things. So right in the center, we have a focal point where these two figures are kind of singled out under this arch. And these are interpreted as Plato and Aristotle here. So Plato, the old man, People speculate that the image of Plato was even a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. Um, let's, let's, I've got some details for you. There we go. So here's uh, Plato and Aristotle. This could be Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, the foreshortening I mentioned includes like this arm coming directly out. Uh, Plato is gesturing upwards, signifying this, the importance of an ideal, and Aristotle is looking at the real, uh, gesturing out towards the world. Um, and uh, this figure that is sitting uh, sort of all alone with this block askew and looking down, he's not talking to anybody, he uh, seems kind of glum. This is thought to be a portrait of Michelangelo, the sculptor, who is at this time working in the very next room, painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And we will look at Michelangelo in the next, um, the next segment of our video. This is thought to be the self-portrait of Raphael, where he included himself here gazing out at the viewer. And this figure in white here <laughs> is the only female in this entire group. So it's all a men's club, but there is a woman. She is Hypatia. She was a Greek woman who wrote about medicine and science. So um, this is the School of Athens in the Vatican by Raphael. And this brings us to the end of part one. Um, the total for, for high Renaissance art is four pieces, four parts. So this is the end of part one.